Hello and welcome to this special presentation broadcast live from the studios of Plymouth Area Community Television, or PAC-TV, here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. I am Dori Stoley, Program Manager for the Goldenrod Foundation, which has organized this event. Our audience includes students from Plymouth South High School, Plymouth Community Intermediate School, and Silver Lake Regional High School in Kingston. I also see some Beach Ambassadors, members of Goldenrod's Volunteer Corps, who promote nature exploration and low-impact enjoyment of our incredible coastal wildlife, plants, and habitat. Big thanks go, of course, to PAC-TV for making this event possible, and to Lindsay Hurt, a Plymouth-based marine mammal specialist and educator, and a beach ambassador, who will be communicating to our online and Twitter audiences as the presentation unfolds. I am delighted to introduce tonight's presenter, Ian Davies, a Plymouth resident who has spent half his life in pursuit of his passion, birds. Many hours on Plymouth Long Beach, among other locations, have honed his powers of observation and his skill in capturing unique and remarkable moments in a bird's life with a camera. The Goldenrod Foundation was fortunate to have Ian as an intern in 2010, monitoring breeding and migratory shorebirds. He has also worked with the nearby Manomet Center for Conservation Sciences in many roles, including that of Arctic shorebird researcher for the past three summers. Now, on to our presentation, A Journey with Shorebirds, From Our Beaches to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Hi, Dory. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to everybody who's tuning in today. Um, so for a little bit about myself before we get into the presentation here, uh, I am a recent graduate of UMass Amherst out in Western Mass with a bachelor's degree in wildlife ecology and conservation. And uh, as Dory said, this fall I've been working as a uh, passerine migrant bander. So uh, putting bands on shorebirds and studying them as they migrate through our area. There will be some more on banding later uh, if you don't know what that is. So getting to our presentation here. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about shorebirds. So if you don't know what shorebirds are right now, stay tuned, and I'll hopefully fix that shortly. We are going to talk about shorebirds all the way from their breeding grounds in northern Alaska and the tundra of North America, through their migration in our area, New England and nearby, down to the wintering grounds as far south as southern South America. So where this all starts, for me at least, is in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, that's a place where I've been able to spend the last three summers uh, working with these birds as they go through their breeding cycle, which up there is uh, over a scant six weeks, because basically everything other side of six weeks up there is winter. So what is a shorebird? So shorebirds are these birds that tend to live along the coastal regions in our area, uh, some more inland, but they're characterized by long-legged, kind of plump little shorebirds that we might see in our beaches near here. So this image right now is a bunch of sanderling and semi-palmated sandpipers that were photographed on our very own Plymouth Long Beach. So in the background, that is Clark's Island and uh, Saquish, for those of you who know the Plymouth area. These shorebirds come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, everything from the size of a little sparrow or mouse up to birds the size of a small dog or even a fox. And we're going to go through a bunch of different sorts of shorebirds, what they do, and kind of why they're special. So some shorebirds, like this white-rumped sandpiper, are well known for their long-distance migration. If you look at this bird, he has very long wings. You might notice they go all the way past the tip of the tail. This bird is known for breeding farther north than there's even much grass. So way north of tree line, north of grass, to basically where you just have rocks. Every year, it'll take off, fly all the way to southern South America, Argentina, Chile, and back and forth. These birds can live 15, 20 years and do this Herculean migration every year. This is one of the birds that has actually been recorded going to Antarctica, one of few shorebirds ever to do so. This is a Baird sandpiper, another species that goes all the way from northern North America to the high elevation grasslands of South America. So this bird will actually go to the middle of the Andes and spend its winter at 15 to 18,000 feet of elevation. 
and come all the way back right through our area here up to north of Canada. You also have bigger shorebirds like this long-billed dowitcher, a very long pointed beak. And this is some, an adaptation for feeding in deep mud. So this bird will actually stick that entire beak all the way into the mud right until he's basically has his face in the dirt. So the outer one third of the bill on this, even though it looks like a straight, unyielding surface, is actually flexible, uh, kind of like uh, chopsticks, maybe. So they can feed in there, and they probe in the mud. And when they encounter a small insect or something, they can actually just kind of open the tip of their beak and snap out the little insect that they might be eating. Another probing build bird is this, these stilt sandpipers, which are uh, truly beautiful birds, in my opinion at least. Really striking barred pattern and nice rufous coloration on the face and head. These birds will also go all the way from the tundra down to Central and South America to winter. And so all of these photos so far, except for Plymouth Beach, have been taken in Alaska. Um, while I've been working up there for the past few years. And stilt sandpipers are also pretty interesting in that they have this crazy flight display where two birds will fly next to each other, kind of flapping really slowly like butterflies, and make noises that sound like donkeys. I know that sounds like something I'm making up, but it's, it's actually real. Another bird, uh, this one is quite cute, uh, in my opinion, the lovely buff-breasted sandpiper. has a big, nice, rounded head and a plump body, looks kind of like a little dove or something, but this is a species that specializes in short grass, and it will be all the way in the short grasslands of the tundra down to the Brazilian and uh, Argentine pampas, which is a large grassland region that is actually uh, where a lot of the beef from the world comes from, and the cattle down there are very important in regulating this, uh, this resource for these birds. Another bird that loves these uh, grasslands is the American golden plover, a truly beautiful bird. Looks like it's wearing some sort of suit almost. And nice golden speckling on the back. And another species that will travel 8,000 8, miles one way, maybe, uh, every year. And it's pretty inconceivable to think that, at least for me, I wouldn't even want to walk 15, 20 miles in a day, whereas these birds will go thousands of miles every year two times for their entire lives. Some species that you can see around here uh, in migration and in winter more frequently than some of these others include this black-bellied plover, another dapper-looking bird. This guy has a nice, nice little suit going on, and they're well-named. I see a black belly on that bird. And they will spend a lot of their winter time as far north as Plymouth Beach. You can go out there and see maybe 100, 200 of these birds in migration with smaller numbers in the winter. Another local guy is this uh, brightly patterned ruddy turnstone. And they're named turnstones for their unique behavior of feeding under rocks. So they'll actually walk along the beach, and every rock they get, they'll just kind of kick it off to the side, stick a little beak under, just flip it over, and it looks almost like they're playing sometimes. But in fact, they're searching for small invertebrates and, and other little bugs underneath these, these rocks. Here is a Dunlin, another striking bird. Um, and again, I'm just showing these all to, to give you kind of an idea of the variety of shorebirds, the variety of uh, both the way that they look, the sizes, and also kind of their life histories. This Dunlin is another bird that breeds on the tundra, but they'll winter almost exclusively here. And between Plymouth and Duxbury Beach in the winter, you can actually see as many as 5,000 of these sometimes in these massive flocks that feed on all of the, the mud flats uh, during the low tides and will hang out on the beaches during the high tides. Now, there are, when we're up there in the summer in the Arctic, there are a few species that we're studying more than uh, the, the rest. So we have five what are called focal species. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more later about what we're doing to gather data on these focal species later on. This is one of them, the uh, red-necked phalarope, uh, quite an interesting name, and uh, well-named, as you can see, nice reddish mark on the neck here. These birds are interesting in that they spend the summers in Alaska, Canada, and then they leave the land. And come the end of July, maybe they'll fly out over the ocean, and they might not return to land until the next May. They're known as pelagic birds, and so they live this lifestyle where their lives, the majority of their lives are spent entirely at sea. 
So they'll form up in these flocks of tens, hundreds, or thousands and go look for uh, insects out in the middle of the ocean. And so they'll find little uh, chunks of floating weed, seaweed, um, all sorts of um, debris in the ocean. And they'll find insects and basically live out there offshore for nine months before flying back up north and going back to land. Another kind of phalarope is the red phalarope, uh, which another aptly named bird. It doesn't look like a shorebird uh, too much. You can see these guys are at home in the water. So like the previous bird, this is another pelagic species that spends its non-breeding season far offshore. And so they swim around like little strangely colored rubber duckies without any sort of uh, worry for, for safety because that's what they're adapted to do. But if you see this, it's like, well, this might not be a shorebird. Brightly patterned, floating in the water. There's just a lot of variation. This pectoral sandpiper is named for a very interesting display that it does, uh, which I'll have a picture of shortly. But this is another one of our focal species. And the last focal species is my personal favorite. And this is one that uh, I've done work with both on the breeding grounds and in migration uh, in Massachusetts, Canada, and Alaska as well. This is the semi-palmated sandpiper. So these guys are smallest uh, of most of the birds we've been talking about. They actually weigh about an ounce, maybe 25 to 29 grams. So this little bird uh, will migrate from northern Canada down to Brazil or Central America for the winter. And at that weight, you could actually mail it across the U.S. for the cost of one stamp. I'm sure that might uh, make part of its journey a little bit easier, except it might not like being in the envelope. But so here they are up there on the, the tundra on their breeding grounds. And then this is a semi-palmated sandpiper that was actually taken right here on our own Plymouth Beach. And so these same birds are using all of these habitats in a, a network, a crucial network, from where they spend their summers to where they spend their winters. So where do they spend their summers? You might see uh, right here up on the top corner, there's a little green arrow. That is where I have lived for the past three summers. Might seem like a strange place to be, but it works for me. If you zoom in a little bit closer, you can see that there's this crazy terrain up there that is just basically rivers and lakes and barrier beaches. And in there, there's tundra, everything in between. Nothing is higher than about four or five inches. The terrain is such that the amount of uh, ground that doesn't freeze is about this big. So if that's all you have to work with for roots, you're not going to have many trees up there. The permafrost just doesn't allow anything bigger to grow. So if you zoom in from that last view a little bit closer, you can actually see on Google Maps, those are the tents that I live in in the summer. And so that one, you can see the cluster of five tents on the left. The bottom left-hand one is where I've lived for the past three summers. The one on the right that's bright yellow is where I've eaten many meals. And when we're living there, we are actually about 40 or 50 miles from the nearest humans. So we fly out there at the beginning of June. Beginning of June, it must be nice, right? It's not that, of, not that much of summer when we get there yet. One of the uh, interesting things that we can see up there, in addition to shorebirds, just a, a brief break from them, there's some really special birds in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and this is one of them. Um, you might even say that this bird is spectacular. This is a spectacled eider. And spectacled eider are a federally endangered species. They're this really rare and bizarre looking duck that basically have pilot's goggles on their entire lives. And there are only a few thousand of them that fly around and breed in these uh, coastal tundra ponds up there. And an interesting thing about them is that nobody knew where they spent their winters until, I think it was the 80s or 90s. Nobody had any idea. They just vanished. And it turns out that someone put radio transmitters on them, and they fly out to the middle of the Bering Sea in the winter in these small natural openings in the ice. And thousands of birds will pack into this small opening. They'll spend the entire winter surrounded by ice about 500 miles offshore. And who would have thought? Movements of birds are sometimes baffling. Another just quick aside as a non-shore bird, one of my favorite birds is this Sabin's gull. Um, everyone might think, oh, just a seagull, like gulls. Who, who really cares too much about them? But I think Sabin's gull is out there to prove that gulls are are more than just something that lives in a parking lot. They're pretty stunning birds with this beautiful pseudo candy corn bill. 
nice uh, gray hood fading to black at the edge and the vivid red eye ring. And if it's not cool enough when it's at rest, in flight, they have this absolutely stunning wing pattern. And uh, it was a pretty, pretty wonderful thing to be able to see on a daily basis. Nests of these guys were within five minutes of where we lived. Back to the shorebirds. When you land on June 3rd in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, this is what you see. Snow and ice. Summer isn't there too much yet, but the birds are. So when we first get there, uh, we'll land in this snowy uh, environment and carry all of our gear about half a mile to where our camp is, set everything up. There's nothing there when we get there, so that's a fun time. And then after that, we start to go see what we can see for the birds. And this is the time of year when everything is displaying. So this is a semi-palmated sandpiper doing a sort of behavior that you would never see in, in these parts. So he's doing this aerial display where he'll kind of do circles over an area and make this kind of motorboat idling noise, just kind of just on and on until a female comes over and is interested. Then he'll kind of ramp up the, the game and do a bunch of displays on the ground. But when you get there, you're just surrounded by dozens of these birds staking out their territories and doing this interesting display. So they'll kind of hover in place for sometimes five or eight minutes while they're doing this. That pectoral sandpiper that I talked about earlier is even more bizarre. So I don't know about you, but that doesn't look like a normal shape for a bird to me. Um, this is a male in f the midst of his display. And so what they do is they have these special air sacs in their, uh, the area of their pectoral muscles, kind of on the chest, so that's why they're called pectoral sandpipers. And they'll go perch on a little elevated area in the middle of their territory and gulp air. If you're close enough, you can actually see them open their bill a little bit, intake a little bit of air, get bigger and bigger until you can actually see this kind of air sac hanging off of the, the front of them. And then when everything is ready and they see a female nearby, they'll take off fly low right at her, and then make this strange booming noise as they actually push that air through a special, special resonator, kind of. And um, every time they do that, they inflate more and more until, like this image, you have this bird that's basically like a flying diamond or football, just a totally improbable shape. And he'll do this about four inches over the female's head. Um, and they'll do this over and over again for maybe three weeks. Just any female that comes into a male territory, he's going to go and do that booming display. And so it sounds like a strange cow, and that's what we fall asleep to most nights, these uh, strange cow noises, those stilt sandpipers making their donkey noises. It's an interesting, interesting world up there. Um, for other displays, the bird that truly takes the cake is the buff-breasted sandpiper. This is that guy earlier. I said, I think he's cute looks kind of dove-like, and here he is walking along. So might not look like too much here. I mean, nice, nice pattern, pretty intricate. But when there are female buff-breasted sandpipers around, they really step their game up. So they have this interesting thing, the males, where they flag other birds down, basically. They'll find a, a big open area and go and just stick their wing up. They're basically exposing their armpit to the world. And they have a bright, bright white underwing. So you can see it from sometimes half a mile away. So this bird is uh, bending forward and running in the effort to show as many people his underwing as possible. So you can see they kind of hold it out and wave it awkwardly like a flag. You can kind of see the, the side, side to top um, change here. And they'll wave repeatedly until they attract someone to come on over. If it's a female, then they'll continue on with the rest of their display. But if it's a male, then things will start to get fairly ugly. And these birds actually display in groups in what is called a lek. And so you can get sometimes 10, 15 or more males all displaying in an area. And if they get too close or infringe on each other's territory, this happens. And you can actually see intense aerial battles sometimes. But if a female comes over instead, he's happy. So then there's the white underwing. Then things, he ramps it up, takes it up a notch starts to, gets close to her, throws both wings up now, and starts shaking them, which unfortunately it can't capture too well in a photo, but he shakes them and makes kind of a noise like maracas, just like this, this, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, repeatedly, while also making noises with his, his own mouth and vocal apparatus. 
So he'll do that. As he gets more into it, he'll start to kind of fall over backwards in his uh, the attempt to impress until eventually he's basically almost all the way over onto his back. And so getting the, the, full, the full frontal, both, um, both underwings showing, is he's trying to get females as close to him as possible and attract, attract him for that. Sometimes, you can see here, there's two males on the right courting a hapless female on the left. And sometimes uh, you'll get more females than males. So it can be kind of hard to make out, but you can see on either side of his head here, there's actually two females. There's one behind him and two right in front of him. The ones in front of him are probably about an inch and a half from his face, inside his wings. And so it's a pretty grueling evaluation process, as far as I can tell. And in my opinion, you haven't been judged until you've been a male buff-breasted sandpiper. It looks, it looks pretty harsh. And I saw these displays maybe 50 or 100 times, maybe more. I never saw a female stay with a male. Every single time the male displayed, the female flew off. I don't know if the species, how this species continues, because at least the males in our area did not have any game. So it was not working well. As the displays kind of wind down, uh, you can see some of the snow is melting now as you look south to the Brooks Range, which is a mountain range visible from where we are. And now it's nesting season. And so what we're doing up there, everything hinges on finding nests. And the terrain is really unique in that it's this uh, polygon uh, habitat that is formed by thawing and melting of ice for thousands of years. And so it creates these kind of irregular polygon shapes that are maybe 10 meters by 5 meters or even just 2 meters by 1 meter, small to big. And each one has a ditch that separates it from the next one. And so we walk across, down into a ditch, up out of a ditch, across, down all day. Um, I think this year I walked 380 miles this summer, um, all in waders, all in marshy habitat. So every time you step in, almost every time your foot goes down into the water, and uh, you come right back out. So it's uh, a, lot of, a lot of work to find these nests, but it's very rewarding when it happens. And so a nest is uh, filled with shorebird eggs when we first find them. And so these eggs are beautiful in their, their patterning, very cryptic um, camouflage. So if you walk, you can even step over a nest and not see it when you look down. Uh, this egg was found away from any nest. We don't take the, the eggs out of the nest unnecessarily, but this was a, a dead egg that wasn't in any nest, so it made for a good, good photo op. This is what a nest looks like uh, if you were to be a very exposed nest. So this might seem like it's a sitting, sitting duck for any, any predator, but it's actually very well camouflaged if you don't have a nice close image of it. So this is a ruddy turnstone, um, that, that guy who was had his beak open earlier with a little bit of red on the back, and they nest out in these open, more barren areas, and we find a few of their nests every year. When you get into the rest of the shorebirds, you get into much more difficult nests to find. So this is a pectoral sandpiper nest, slightly greenish tint to the eggs with nice big brown uh, splotches on them. And this is something that you can't find, basically, unless you see the bird leave the nest or go to the nest. So our entire time up there is basically spent watching bird behavior. You just l get to learn the birds by the species, by the individual sometimes even. And so you'll go back to an area, we're walking the same area every day, and sometimes you'll have this one bird that you see flush off of a nest in this area. Because you'll be walking along and you'll see them take off, and you kind of get to know after a while when they're taking off of a nest. But the bird is so wily that it won't ever lead you to the nest. So we'd have birds who'd be like, oh, did you, did you get that, that semi-sandpiper there? No, it's still there. And we'd send people back day after day trying to find the nest. Sometimes it would take 10 days or two weeks um, just to locate one single nest. Um, this year we actually found, I believe it was 340 shorebird nests. Um, so it was a, a very large number for there. And we monitor all of them throughout the summer and uh, all the way through chicks and beyond. So... Nests normally have four eggs in them because that is actually the most thermally efficient. So if you figure you have four kind of uh, cone shapes, if they're, both, if they're all pointing inwards, then the way that they're going to stay the warmest is if there's four. If there's three, there's going to be too much space. If there's five, there's going to be not enough space. So if you look here, this is looking down from higher up over a nest. You might notice there aren't four eggs. 
There are five here. So this is a semi-palmated sandpiper that actually laid five eggs. And this is the first instance of a semi-palmated sandpiper being described with five eggs that we could find of in history. Um, so it was pretty interesting. It had five eggs this day. We went back the next day. It had four. Who knows what happened to the fifth? It just was seemingly that one day. But you never know what you'll find out there. And this is a, a better, better example of a hidden nest. So I said earlier, you have to really know the birds to kind of be able to find these nests. This is the red phalarope, one of those pelagic species that goes out to the ocean. And in general, the brighter the bird, uh, the more likely it's going to be a male. Males are brighter, females are uh, more drab in their plumage. This is a pretty bright bird. You can see it's pretty red. This one is also a red phalarope, but much more drab. Do you think that's the female? That's the male. Not in this case. Phalaropes are very interesting also in that they have complete sex role reversal, it's called. So the males um, occupy what is usually the female role in the species, and the females occupy what is usually the male role. So the females are bright. All the females compete for a male. And then when they've gotten their male, they go lay the eggs in a nest for him, because he can't do that, and then they leave. And they'll never see the nest ever again. They'll never see the young. They'll never do anything more with parenting. The male incubates all the eggs on his own, raises all the young, and then leaves at the end of that. But all, the female's only role in the species is just to lay the eggs. And it's a very interesting thing that these birds that are occurring in the same area range as all these others have for some reason adopted this, this role, um, this, this strategy for breeding. This is, holds true in the red-necked phalarope as well. So this guy, or girl, female, male. This one can be very drastic. You can see this one has almost no red at all, pretty dingy brown on the sides. This one, nice crisp plumage above, nice red neck. So phalaropes are very strange birds in addition to spending their, their winters at sea, their they are also males or females, and the females are males. Here is a red-necked phalarope on a nest, actually. Uh, if you look very carefully, you can just see his tail is sticking up on the left-hand side, and his head is facing right in the middle. You can see a little bit of reddish in there, maybe, and a little bit of white. That's his cheek. So these guys are really good at sitting on the nest until you are right on top of them. So I've actually gone, we check the nests every few days, I've actually walked up to a phalarope and picked it up off the nest kind of looked at it and let it go on its way. But when you have to check the nest, you have to look at the eggs. And so sometimes these birds will literally sit on the eggs. You'll look down at them. They'll look back up at you. It's like, come, I'm just, just move along. And they won't sometimes. And here is another bird on a nest. This one is even harder to see. Just left of center, facing right, there is a pectoral sandpiper head. So it's just a little dot with a black beak coming off of that. And so this is even from maybe 15, 20 feet away. When they're on the nest, you just can't see it. It is totally invisible unless they fly off the nest or lead you back to it. Another one on the right here, a long-billed dowager. Just you can see the back. And they'll sit right on the nest until you're right on top of them. So once we find the nests, like I said, we monitor them uh, to see whether they hatch or not. And another thing we do is we band the birds there. So you might notice this bird has a little bit of decoration, decorative jewelry on its legs, if you will. And so there are three color bands on the right leg, and a flag, which is that green uh, marker on the upper leg, that has a unique name on it. So this bird, I believe, is EVC. So each bird up there gets a unique marker that allows us to identify it every year as it comes back, year after year. So by doing this and seeing how well these birds are succeeding from year to year, we are able to monitor the success of populations as a whole and see how the populations are doing, whether they're increasing, decreasing, or uh, remaining about the same. But how do you capture the birds? That's always the, the logical question after, well, you're marking them. So we're marking them with just these, these lightweight plastic and metal bands that weigh no more to a bird than a wristwatch does to us. So it's not actually hampering the birds, but it allows us to get a lot of information that helps the species as a whole. So we catch them with these bow nets. So you can see kind of a, a crescent moon of net here. And right in the middle of that, even though you can't see, is a nest. 
So this is a spring-loaded trap that you put over the nest, and then you go and you lay down in a ditch about 20, 30 feet away. Someone else is even further away watching with binoculars. And then the bird gets on, and they, they pull it. You pull the trap, and it snaps trap. It snaps over the top. It's soft mesh that allows a lot of area for the bird to kind of fly into the side of the net. And when it does that, we run up, take the bird out, and then we band it. So you can see when this bird is in your hand that it is tiny. This is the guy that weighs a little bit less than an ounce. And these guys, again, will fly thousands of miles each way every year. So you can see this is a different bird that has uh, white, blue, green, as opposed to white, blue, white, like the last one. So I'm not sure what his three-letter three code is. So we put bands on all these birds, which enables us to figure out whether they're coming back or not. But sometimes uh, you, you want to learn a little bit more. So this is a flag uh, with the, the three letters on it. You might notice this one's blue. Blue means that this bird was flagged in Brazil. So we were out there going around on our day-to-day -day duties. Uh, this was two summers ago. And out walking around, see a bird kind of fly in with a, a band on the leg. It's like, oh, it must be one from last year. We look at it, it's blue. That means that it's from Brazil. Start freaking out, take a bunch of photos. Turns out it was a guy who had banded this bird in Brazil the winter before, and it had flown all the way up, and out of the, the three million estimated semi-palmated sandpipers in the world, this one had landed on this five-square-mile study area in the middle of Alaska. And he never nested. We went back and we checked every day. He would fly around doing his, his motorboat display, and it never, never worked out for him. Um, he didn't come back the next year, so we're not sure what happened. But the next year, almost crazier, we go out, same thing happens. Brazil flag, but a different one. So if the odds for the first one were low, now we're talking lottery odds here. Just un unbelievable circumstance that, they would get, that we would get two of their birds on our breeding grounds. So another bird from Brazil, this one, it had a nest, hatched out three young, and uh, we sent them on their way, and who knows, they're probably in Brazil right now, or at least on their way. Another thing that we do is uh, what's called a, putting on what's called a geolocator. So you see this bird has something on its leg, but it's not letters or numbers. A geolocator is this really uh, interesting kind of new technology that's been coming out that is incredibly lightweight. And so these geolocators are able to be put on really small birds, and they measure two things. They measure the amount of light and what time it is. They have a really accurate clock and a light sensor. And believe it or not, from those two data points, you can tell in the world where you are within about 100 kilometers. And that is simply by finding out the time of sunset, the time of sunrise, the length of the day, and that's it. With that, you can get latitude and longitude. And so these amazingly simple things have allowed us to learn some really interesting things about, about shorebirds. So this map here is from a semi-palmated sandpiper that had a geolocator put on in uh, Coates Bay, which is that uh, island just to the north of Hudson Bay up there, where the line starts at the top. And the thing about geolocators is you have to catch the bird next year and take the instrument off in order to get the information. So this bird was, it was equipped with the geolocator last year. And this summer, uh, some researchers from Manomet Center for Conservation Sciences, uh, who I'm working for now, went back and they uh, recaptured this bird and took the geolocator off. And so you can see here, the right-hand line, the bird goes down uh, a little bit and then takes this straight shot all the way from Canada to, I believe, Venezuela or um, Guyana. And that is a six-day non-stop flight that this bird did on its migration south in the fall. And so they'll actually get to an area, eat uh, so much over the course of maybe two to three weeks that they can double their weight. So it's the equivalent of going into a supermarket, eating yourself sick until you gained about 150, 200 pounds, and then taking off and flying 8,000, 5,000 miles. I mean, I couldn't even run 10 steps after doing that, much less fly that far. And so 
what allows them to do this, in addition to the amount of fat reserves that they put on, is they're actually able to sleep half their brain at a time. And so when they're flying along, they can just sleep parts of their brain, and that enables them to be well-rested enough to continue this journey nonstop without, without needing to pause for any sort of refreshment or sleep. Pretty astounding. And going back to the Arctic now, we are uh, kind of getting to the end of the, the season up there, and now is the time for babies up there, chicks. We also, at this time of year, are really lucky to have an amazing caribou show. Again, this isn't shorebirds, but life in the Arctic refuge is also about the mammals. So we've seen polar bear, wolf, grizzly bear, all sorts of other interesting mammals. And we have a caribou herd that migrates through every year that numbers, depending on the year, in our area, we see 10 to 40,000. And so this was part of a herd of, I think it was eight or 10,000 that night that were all sleeping basically around our tents. So sometimes you'll wake up in the morning, you'll just hear this strange grunting noise coming from everywhere. And it sounds like distant thunder when they start running. And it's a, the American Serengeti, we called it. You can also see weather coming from really far away. Really interesting thing about being on a, a plane, uh, just a grassy plane out there. And you can see this rainstorm that's maybe 40 miles off. And uh, with the rain also comes the mosquitoes. I won't get into the mosquitoes too much, but the caribou are there because they have to come out to the coast to avoid being exsanguinated, which is a super fancy word for saying suck dry. So they can actually die of low blood pressure because there's so many mosquitoes. So they lose so much blood that they actually can't pump it through their entire body. So next time you're being bitten by a few mosquitoes, just think it, it could be a whole lot worse. So the chicks are wonderful. It makes us feel successful when we're out there and have kind of uh, tended to these, these young and monitored the nest, and then they start hatching out. Here's some ruddy turnstone chicks some buff-breasted sandpiper chicks. And these guys, all these shorebirds are pretty uh, interesting in that they are very precocial. So the chicks will hatch out, the eggs will be incubated for maybe 20 days. Chicks will hatch out, these guys are probably a couple hours old, and usually within six to eight hours, they're gone from the nest, never to return. They'll never go back. They're out, the male bird usually takes care of them for a while, um, and then after maybe 10 to 12 days, they still can't fly. And in a lot of species at that time, the adults actually abandon them. And all these flightless young will wander around for another week or so until they can fly away. And just more gratuitous, uh, cute shorebird baby shots. This is a pectoral sandpiper brood. And you can actually see one of the eggs in the background that has uh, just recently hatched. There's probably another chick um, because there tends to be four chicks in each one of these nests. And red phalarope babies. So these are the guys that spend their, their time at uh, sea. And so they have really big feet. And if you look in the bottom one here, you can actually see that kind of gray blob in the lower left going all the way over to under its chin is its leg. So one of the most comical thing about these little guys, I mean, they're barely bigger than cotton balls on stilts that they're, when they're hatched out, their legs are actually full size. So you have these giant gangly legs with this little fuzzball on top and they're kind of running around, barely able to, to keep balance and they fall over, they're tripping over grass and it's, it's generally a very, very cute experience. But you can see the size of this leg. The leg is as big as the bird right now. And so these, again, since they're in the nest, are less than six or eight hours old. After a little while, they'll start running around and you can see the semi-palmated sandpiper chick in the bottom here with the uh, attending adult just above. And you can see they have this very cryptic speckled plumage. And so if that bird were to, the chick were to sit down, you couldn't see it if you didn't know it was there. They really blend in just like all the other stages of, of these birds' lives. The buff-breasted sandpiper with a brood. Um, so the, all the chicks together are known as the brood and they're running around here on a little gravel bar eating insects. But it gets cold after a while because it's pretty cold up there. So after that happens, you gotta go warm up for a little while. And so they'll basically just tuck under uh, mama's wing here and they make for ridiculous little eight-legged uh, creatures just hanging out 
And so they'll warm the young up for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then they'll kind of dodder around for a little while until they get cold, and then come on back. Um, we were really lucky to have this buff-breasted sandpiper brood right around camp one day. And this chick is a couple days old now and was heading over to, uh, to warm up under, under mom. And like I said before, they'll only be around with the parents for maybe 10, 12 days or so, uh, and sometimes as long as maybe 18 days. But then usually they're deserted by the parents, and they'll actually often form uh, roving bands of youngsters that'll maybe 15 or 20 little young shorebirds that are all running around together, none of which can fly. And so safety in numbers, I guess. Um, even though this isn't a shorebird, uh, another adorable thing we get to see. This is a uh, baby red-throated loon uh, taking a ride on its mother's back uh, one late evening. And I say late evening, this is actually taken at 1 a.m., I believe, this photo. Uh, one of the strange things about living in the Arctic, I always forget about it because I live there, the sun doesn't set. I don't see the sun set for almost two months. And when you're that far north, what happens is when dawn comes, the sun is uh, to your east, and then it spends all day going overhead like a normal sun. Then in the evening when it would be dusk, it gets down to the west. And then that's when everything just breaks down and it just goes around the horizon to the north all night. Just like maybe uh, a little ways, like it is an hour before sunset here. It just goes all the way around the horizon to the north and then dawn comes and it's over there again. And it goes overhead and it just does that every day. So there is no sunset. So we always joke about going out, well, don't come back until the sun sets, like, until your work's done. So that would be a long time. Sun doesn't set from about May through late August, I believe, up there. More shorebird babies. Here is a uh, semi-palmated sandpiper that's maybe four or five days old now, running around pretty well on its own, fending for itself. Red phalarope, they, they can swim from from when they leave the nest because they're born swimmers and this guy was sprinting along the edge of a puddle heading for deeper water. And after a little while you get these pretty old chicks like this semi-palmated sandpiper that they, they want to pretend like they're pretty much good to go but if you look this guy is super fuzzy around his neck and head has a little short bill and his wings aren't grown yet. So in maybe three or four days this guy will be able to grow or will be able to fly rather but he's still got a little bit more time. And so at this time of year, when the chicks are pretty much flying and heading out, that's time for us to head out as well. So this is an aerial view taken from the plane as we leave. You can see the yellow tents down there. The one on the left is, ones on the left are where we sleep, and the ones on the right are where we eat and cook. Um, you can see in the distance there, across the, the water to the distant water, there is the, um, the Arctic Ocean, actually. And so we live about three miles from the ocean up there. Quite a, uh, quite a life on the edge of the world. And when we get down here now, all these birds are in migration. So this is a fresh, young, uh, semi-palmated sandpiper that is on a beach here in Massachusetts, just having left the Arctic a couple weeks prior. And even though they've never made this journey before, they'll fly just as far as the adults every year, navigating using the stars and their own uh, internal compass. They can actually sense the Earth's magnetic fields. They have some iron deposits that uh, allow them to tune in like a compass and just travel and do these routes that their species has been traveling for thousands of years, even though they themselves have never done it before. Sometimes you just see one, and sometimes you see thousands. This photo here was taken up at the Bay of Fundy in New Brunswick uh, and Nova Scotia, and they have hundreds of thousands of semi-palmated sandpipers staging there every year. You can barely pick out an individual bird in this photo, and I believe there's probably somewhere between two and 3,000 birds in this one image. And so you can go up there and see these flocks of 30 or 40,000 birds wheeling around, and it makes you imagine what it used to be like. And say what it used to be like, because it's unfortunate that a lot of these shorebirds are in serious decline. They're really, um, really being hit quite hard and a lot of these stopover areas are really crucial for them. So this is our very own Plymouth Beach right here. Uh, you might recognize the bug light in the background if you've ever taken whale watch out of Plymouth or anything like that. And that's a flock of wheeling shorebirds in front. And so these shorebirds are 
are here stopping over doing that refueling where they have to put on all that fat in order to take the next stage of their journey and a lot of these areas are threatened and uh, some of the the birds are declining by 50 percent or more and there's a lot of worrisome information from both the migration and wintering grounds that the reality could be even more than we know and so next time you're out on a beach, whether it be here or elsewhere, New England, further afield, there are shorebirds everywhere. There's over 200 species in the world. And just keep an eye out. You might notice in the winter when the waves are lapping that there's a flock of birds kind of following the waves in and out, feeding right at the edge. And those could be Sanderling or Dunlin or something like that that you don't have to put a name to. But maybe now at least you'll kind of have some appreciation for the journey that these birds undertake every year, the places they go, and the, the things that they do that when you just see a snapshot of them in migration, you might not really have that full understanding. And a lot of these birds are crucial in the habitat of all of these, or the health of all these coastal ecosystems, excuse me. And their regulation of all the, the insects, so the invertebrates, uh, for example, if these birds weren't here to eat all of these invertebrates, then they might cycle through the, the mud, uh, but feeding on the mud more fast, more quickly, which would create lots of erosion, which would make our beaches not be what they are today. So even though it might not seem like they're helping out in any way, everything is tied together, and you don't know what could happen if you take one critical piece out of the puzzle. And so... With that, I would like to thank you um, for, for watching, listening, or coming here today, and I would love to take any questions that, I, uh, that you might have. You yes. said that on two occasions you saw birds that were banded or tagged in Brazil. Is mm -hmm. that information recorded anywhere so the folks in Brazil can say, wow, our birds made it to the Arctic? Exactly. Uh, it, it is. So we actually emailed the person we happen to know who is banding birds in Brazil, we emailed him using a satellite phone from the Arctic within 24 hours of finding it. And within 24 hours of that, we had an email back with the date that bird was banded, how much it weighed, how old it was, everything about it. And so the, the way that this, there's kind of a central organization uh, for the, Ameri the Americas, it's the United States Geologic Survey, USGS that regulates the bands. So there's a central repository where if you report anything, you'll get information back on that. Thank you. No problem. Can I offer a question from our online community? Of course. Juan from Mashby is asking if you or your coworkers see any impacts from climate change over the last few years. And if so, how will climate change impact the long range migratory birds? That's a great question. And so we've been up there. Uh, this was actually the fifth year of a five-year study. Um, it was called the Arctic Shorebird Demographic Network. So it was a network of 16 or 17 locations, ranging from eastern Canada to uh, Siberia and Russia. And we were all collecting the same information on these birds, their breeding productivity, how many were coming back every year, and uh, life history parameters like that in order to kind of determine how the populations are doing. And up there on the, the North Slope and these tundra areas, it's really quite evident that the, the habitats are changing very quickly. And there are plants that occur where we are that didn't used to occur there. Certain habitats, especially more south, are growing up. Um, so they don't freeze as much, which allows more roots in the plants. So a lot of these crucial tundra grasslands are actually turning into kind of shrublands. And this is happening more in Canada. And they used to go to these places to monitor these breeding birds, and they just don't exist there anymore. There, there's just no habitat left. And on migration, a lot of the, the crucial sites are uh, tidal locations that the amount of water flowing over the ecosystem is very, very important for regulating it. And with sea level rise due to climate change, that could have a severe impact on the overall uh, ecosystems in these coastal locations, and as a result, the migrant birds that are, are using them. And they're considered to be very susceptible to negative effects of climate change. Um, many different reports and national advisory things have, have stated that. 
back to our live audience. Any questions for Ian? Ian, how many people were on the team that went up there with you? Um, up there in the Arctic during the summer, we, have, we had four to seven people, depending on the year. And so we all go out in, in pairs for, for safety for grizzly bears. And um, we go out and monitor these, these shorebirds every day for uh, six to seven weeks. And at the end of that, I'll, I'll come back. So a, a fairly small crew, but sizable enough to be able to allow us to find all these nests, band all the birds, and take all the information down. Have you ever had to um, worry about like uh, the dangers like, of other animals? Um, yeah, so when we're up there, grizzly bears are, are the, the main uh, problem. We, we only see maybe th three to four grizzly bears uh, a year up there. But we have to carry shotguns at all times and go out in pairs, and we have electrified fencing around our, our sleeping areas, just in case. Any other questions from our live studio audience? If someone wanted to see the migrating birds where they're uh, going north and then south, what would be a good time to be out on the beach to see that? If you want to go out and see the most shorebirds that you can, which I would recommend to everybody, of course. I, a place like Plymouth Beach uh, is a great spot up on the North Shore, Plum Island or Newbury, in Newburyport, out on the Cape, Chatham, any of the outer beaches there. If you go out in May, uh, mid to late May, any time from then through about early September, birds will be migrating through. And the species actually are going to such different latitudes that the ones that are going to the southern latitudes where it's warming earlier will be migrating through in May. And the ones that are going further north will be migrating through in June. And then the ones that are coming south from the southerly areas are coming back in July. So there's a nonstop shorebird migration from basically May through September, one direction or the other. If you go out on a beach, you'll probably see some shorebirds. And at Plymouth Beach, I've seen as many as 15 to 20,000 birds in a single day. If you go out there right uh, at the right tide on the right day, and you would never know it that, that that's such a crucial location uh, for a lot of these, these threatened birds. Referring back to your shotgun comment, mm -hmm. someone from the online community is asking if you've had any run-ins with bears. Um, we have not had run-ins with bears. We have had uh, bears come fairly close, but usually they come on up and they, they check out whether you're a human. They'll stand on their hind legs, maybe get 20 or 30 meters away stand on their hind legs, kind of look at you, and you wave at them and go, I'm a human, and please don't come any closer. And uh, then they usually sniff the air a few times, and then when they get downwind of you, the second they smell human, they turn and run. They're really used to having their kind hunted by humans for a long time, and so they'll just run. Uh, we had one this year that was kind of working near camp. The second it got downwind to camp, stood up, looked at us, turned. We watched it run for about 20 minutes. It never stopped. Ran through rivers, ran through ponds. Just incredible fear of humans um, due to, due to our, uh, our effects on them over the years. I have another question from someone who could not make it to the live audience tonight mm -hmm. about citizen science. Are there any opportunities in the Plymouth region for people to get involved with what you're doing to be able to help out as a volunteer or someone who's interested that maybe the organizations you work for could provide a platform for them to learn more um, or yeah. to help? Yeah, so for, uh, for helping in general, uh, a great citizen science platform is something called eBird. Just simple eBird.org. It is a, uh, an organization that is run through Cornell, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it's probably one of the most sizable and well-used citizen science programs ever, as far as I know. So citizen science is just taking uh, your, your standard person's kind of inputs into whatever data you're collecting. So eBird is just people going out and logging their bird sightings. It's as simple as that, but I believe that they just reached 200 million observations. So if you have 200 million data points in something you're trying to answer, that's going to be a pretty good start. So even though it's not rigorous scientific data collection, if you go out to your local beach, and you see 100 semi-palmated sandpipers. If you go to eBird and put that in and say that you saw that, where you saw it, you're helping uh, inform future management and conservation efforts about this species. 
and who knows what use that could be. Excellent. Do we have any more questions from our audience? May I ask one, Ian? Of course. <laughs> I'd really like to know if you have a life list for birds. I do happen to have a life list. <laughs> what are your absolute necessary must-see in your lifetime? Must-sees. So for those of you who don't know, a life list is simply a list of all the birds you've seen in your life. Uh, so I've kind of been following a cycle over the past few years of make some money, spend it all traveling to go look at birds somewhere. And it seems to work for me uh, as long as I can make enough in order to go to the next place. But I believe as of now I've seen 2,956 species of birds of the just over 10,000 in the world. So almost a third of the way there. Um, but I would love to see as many different shorebirds as possible. There's some really unique ones out there, ones that stand two feet tall and have uh, four or five inch long beaks and things that are endemic to islands in the middle of nowhere that it would just be wonderful to see someday. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, PAC TV for uh, hosting this, uh, Dory Stoley and the Goldenrod Foundation for making this, this possible, and to everybody who tuned in and came tonight. Thank you very much, and have a good night.